Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, the two o'clock block on Friday. Usually we call this likable science. Today we're going to call it thoroughly dislikable science. <laughs> <laughs> That's Ethan Allen. Hi, Ethan. <laughs> Good to see you, Jay. He's a, he's a real host. <laughs> We're, we're doing a QAnon on who the real host is. <laughs> and today we're going to talk about um, something completely unlikable, dislikable, toxins, weaponizing toxins. It came to my attention this week how much is going on wow. in weaponizing toxins in the world. So today we want to study that and talk about the actions of, the, of how it works, you know, biochemically, and talk about how people make them and issues of safety and self-protection and how you deal with them either on the battlefield or in the water supply. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow. So Ethan, as in so many other things, you are an expert in <laughs> biotoxins and we want to ask you about it. Uh, so the first, the first thing is, let's define our terms. Um, what is a toxin, a biotoxin? Uh, how does it come into being and what does it do to people? So toxins are substances that are produced by organisms. And that's a, a real key distinguishing thing. They're, they're not artificial chemicals or chemicals you've extracted just from the environment. They're substances produced by organisms that hurt other organisms, basically, that harm other organisms, usually by chemically reacting. You don't do it synthetically. It's no, got to be by an organism. Right. If you, if, if you it's got to be by a bacteria or a, or a virus. virus or a fun, fungus or an animal. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, some, yeah. Or, you have, or, or a snail. Or, or, or we did snail. a show yes. on snails. Exactly. And, and Cone toxins, snails, yeah. yeah. Uh, plants can have toxins, right? Any living thing, if, it, if it's not a living thing that produces it, it's not a toxin. It may be a poison, which has basically the same impacts, but it's not a toxin technically. It's a toxicant, they, they would call it. So, so how am I exposed to a toxin? Well, that can be through any of a number of different ways. Uh, to toxins, if they are injected into you by their animal host, are called venoms, typically. Snake bite is a classic example. Bee stings are a classic example. The, the bee is injecting a substance that's produced into you, and that substance is causing your tissues to react rather badly. Uh, usually with a bee sting, it's not too bad, right? It's just a little welt of some sort. But if you're allergic to bee stings, it can be quite deadly. Anaphylactic shock. Talk, and if it could be fatal. Yeah, if it's something like a coral snake or a cobra, the toxins it's injecting are heavy-duty neurotoxins. They affect your nervous system and stop your nervous system from working. And pretty soon, you can't breathe. And when you can't breathe, you can't live. When you can't breathe, you've you, you got three minutes left. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. wow. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, um, they, they can operate in different ways, but it sounds well, like the most lethal of them uh, is a kind of toxin that stops, it's a neurotoxin that stops you from breathing. Those are certainly a, a very, very deadly class of them because we rely on our nervous system so much, yeah. Uh, others can be, there are others, the necrotizing toxins that, that just start sort of chewing away at whatever cells they end up on, causing these cells to start leaking out their contents and dying off. That'll be the rattlesnake toxin. Uh, those are some. Uh, the brown recluse is a classic example. A little spider bites you. You first get a little welt, but the welt just doesn't heal. Instead, just gradually, your skin just starts deteriorating and, and sloughing off and it goes deeper and your, your underlying tissues begin to die off and the muscles beneath it begin to die off and yeah, and your, all your tissue just begins to just corrode away, basically. Yeah, and, and it, it, it flows through the body. It's not right. just limited to one site. Right. And some of these, um, some of these bacteria uh, or uh, viruses can be infectious. So uh, when they create a toxin in, in one person, that's, that, can, that can pass to another person by virtue of the uh, originating bacteria or virus. Yeah. Right, exactly. If it's, if it's a living system, that is a bacteria or virus or a fungus that's in you and replicating, it's, po it's not only poisoning you, releasing its toxins into you, but then you may be spreading it around, giving your friends and families new colonies of these bacteria or viruses or fungi or whatever, and then start poisoning them too, yeah, so. Yeah, so there's really the whole thing about toxins, at least as far as human beings are concerned, it's a study in, in poison. It's a study in, in, in lethal poisons. Right. And a lot of these are lethal. And you may think that a certain introduction of a certain toxin, you know, you can, you can deal with that. You can shove it off. But, but some, sometimes it's pretty clearly going to be lethal. 
and you cannot escape. Yeah, they, I mean, most of them do have, they've got what's called an LD50, a lethal dose 50%, right? Uh, that, that is a tiny amount of it won't hurt you and a bigger amount will kill off half the population and a still bigger amount will kill off anyone who gets it. Yeah. Indeed, this is the whole principle that they use toxins uh, cosmetically, the botulinus toxin is a classic example. Botox. Botox, right. It so a little bit is okay. Very, very tiny. I mean, that, that toxin is so nasty that literally a few micrograms, I believe, will kill a person. And so when they're giving it to you to get rid of your wrinkles, they're giving you nanograms or atograms. I mean, they're giving you just really a few tiny molecules. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really remarkably tiny doses. It's hard, it's hard to think that uh, having the benefits of Botox justifies having the dangers of, of, of botulinum toxin. You would think so, but again, the, the people who eat uh, the puffer fish, right? Uh, Tetrodotoxin is incredibly toxic, incredibly dangerous. The chefs who prepare the puffer, puffer fish have to be carefully trained because they purposely leave just a little bit of the tissue that has this toxin on the meat that you cook and then eat because it, it gives the funny mouth feel to, to it and, and all that. It ain't worth it. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, you, I don't care how you, good it is. You don't it want chef in training to fix your, <laughs> fix your puffer fish. Away, a few away. Yeah. Nice slips a little bit. You know, you're <laughs> boom, you're, you're out of there. Yeah. Well, you know, but, but our show today is, uh, is, you know, it assumes, I mean, it, it sort of wraps around the notion that uh, these, these toxins really don't, in general, do any good for anybody. Uh, they're, 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 they kill you. Yeah, I mean, they're meant, biological organisms are producing them for one of two reasons. They're either defending themselves against potential threats yeah. or they're going after other organisms to try to eat yeah. or stop these other organisms. Yeah. You know? they're, they're super poisons. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, um, of course, naturally, you know, mankind, humankind <laughs> is imperfectible. And therefore, there are those among us uh, who will take these toxins and all these biological processes and weaponize them. Yeah. So can you talk about that? Sure. So, I mean, there was a classic example back in the 1980s in, in Oregon. The, the, the Rajneeshis, uh, followers of the Bhagwan Shri Rajneesh, decided they wanted to win the local election in their county, basically. And they had their own candidate up who they knew wouldn't win, basically. So they went and put some toxins in the water systems, and uh, sprayed it on a bunch of lettuce and distributed it to all the food stores. They, they spread it on doorknobs. They did everything. They sickened 700, 800 people. You know, they, they thought they'd keep the voting population down and win the election this way. Uh, and uh, he did. He, uh, well, that was, I think, what drove him to try to flee the country. <laughs> he was ultimately caught in Charlotte and <laughs> he was serving jail time somewhere. <laughs> so. But, I mean, yeah, it, it, people tried to use them on mass scales like that. Um, well, you know, there's two, there's two level, levels of it. One, we should talk about Kim Jong-un and how he killed his brother. Right. Um, and uh, my understanding of that is that, uh, like, uh, like uh, the glue, uh, epoxy glue, you have two elements, right. and e either one of them is kind of inert, mm -hmm. but if you put them together, they form a very strong bond. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with some of these toxins. You, you have a, one element and then a second element, right. neither one of them is dangerous. As soon as you put them together, they're, they're fatal. Yeah. And what he did was he had one woman go to the brother and uh, stroke his face with her hands, mm -hmm. you know, hold his cheeks, I guess, right. and she put on element number one, which was okay, and then a second woman comes around, and her hands were coated with the active, active, activating agent. She put his hand, her hands on his face. Now the two were together, right. okay, and and he died. Yeah. He had uh, he had neurotoxins in his body, couldn't breathe, and he died. I don't know which one it was, but right. that was pretty dramatic and very high tech for North yeah. Korea. You got to give them credit that they knew that much. Yeah. By the way, the, the asterisk to the story is that uh, the, the second woman. Uh, by touching the, 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 the face of the individual, she, got, she, she, she had oh, both oh. kinds of toxins yeah. on her hands, okay, and she, her job was to get into a bathroom really quick and wash her hands, but she wasn't quick enough, and she yeah. also got sick. Yeah, no, they're very fast acting often. Uh, that, that biological mixing of things is actually common in the bombardier beetles that produce these jets of explosive caustic chemicals do that. They have two chemicals that by themselves are perfectly fine, and they essentially squirt glands, mix them in a little chamber, and 
get this explosive cloud of, of acrid, toxic stuff. So this, you know, poisoning has been going on since Romeo and Juliet. Before, right. Oh, long before <laughs> that, you know, ancient Hemlock. Rome. Hemlock, thank right. you. Uh, I wonder what they used for, well, I guess it was just a, it was a plant, it was an right. agricultural plant. Um, and, and that's, that's uh, uh, directed at an individual, a single right. person, like, like uh, what uh, the Russians did to that, uh, the spy and his wife in, in the UK, they killed right. him with some advanced kind of poison like this. Um, but that's just targeted at one person or maybe mm -hmm. two people. Now we have the notion of weaponizing, that changes it. As you mentioned, you could do 700 people in a shot. Right. Uh, and if you get the right thing in the water supply for uh, a city, which is, uh, you know, in, intensely populated, um, you're going to be able to reach a lot more than 700 people. And if you use the right mixture in the water system, everybody drinks that water, um, you, could, you could kill the city. Um, in this theory. Is, hmm? In theory. Most, in, most, in theory. It hasn't happened yet. Right, most big cities are pretty careful these days about, they will look for a lot of different things in their water. Because yes. they understand. They look for them. They look for They them. look for they, things they, like yeah, this. Oh, yeah. They, I they, hope they, so. are, they are aware that people may do this. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, if you want to weaponize things, you have to you have to figure out how to reach a large number of people, um, you know, either in a city, in a civilian setting, or on the battlefield, mm -hmm. because it really works well on the battlefield if everybody can't breathe. Um, and, th and then you have to deploy right. that weapon right. uh, somehow through the water or the air, or, uh, or maybe an, an infectious disease it right. have the same effect. Yeah, I mean, basically, these days, producing a sort of a biological toxin is really child's play, more or less. Uh, anyone can do it in their garden shed for a couple thousand bucks. You can probably crank out That's some anthrax. Wonderful you know? about modern technology. Yeah. But then getting it into the right format, storing it well, getting it dispersed where you want it, when you want it, having it stay only there and not blow back on yourself and your friends. That's a much trickier part technologically. You have to freeze the stuff to keep it? Some, some things you do. Uh, many of these biological ones, though, you don't have to freeze it, but they may not be very stable. They may have a very lose, limited lose shelf, shelf life. Yeah. Power, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's the, the weapon on, weaponization is really the much harder step than actually producing the toxin. You know? Well, I mean, it, is this something that a terrorist would try? Because I mean, the standard argument has been, as you said, it could blow back on you. Right. So you think, um, you know, uh, um, you're going to kill somebody else, you wind up killing yourself. Or, or you wind up killing the whole world, including you. Right. Um, so it may, it may not be all that attractive in, in terms of a way to go. Maybe there are other better ways to, to fight a dirty war. <laughs> uh, but, but what about that? I mean, is that still uh, a it's, disincentive uh, sure. for, for people who are capable, for example, of doing uh, suicide bombing? Sure. Uh, they don't care. Why don't they do it? Well, I mean, so uh, again, anthrax is a good example because anthrax are quite deadly if you're doing an inhalation dust form spores. It can be up to 90% in untreated individuals. Now you can treat people for it and reasonably effectively, but you can also sort of pre protect yourself with, with a, a other chemicals, uh, antibiotics uh, treatment. You can get ready so that even if it blows back on you, if you've given this treatment to yourself and your friends, you, get, you guys are going to be okay. And as we get more sophisticated biologically uh, with technologies like CRISPR that you and I have talked about before, yeah. this kind of thing is going to become even trickier because they're going to make more finely tuned toxins, they're going to make more highly effective antidotes. So you, you can put out a nasty blast of compound that's really toxic to a lot of people quick pop yourself with all the antidotes and your friends with all the antidotes, and now you guys are the only survivors in a big mess of dead people. You know? well, what's interesting is that you really describe two situations. One is you can vaccinate them in advance. You can take all the troops who are going to go on the battlefield, you can catch them in boot camp right. and vaccinate them against it, you know, known, known risks like this, it, yeah. or you can wait and or you can wait until they've been exposed <laughs> yeah. on the battlefield and, try to treat and then you can give them an antidote of some kind. Yeah. So which one? Is it different strokes for different folks, different strokes for different kinds of toxins? What, what is it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is, it's a situational thing. Some of the uh, 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 protective treatments may themselves have bad side effects. And so you're, you're reluctant to do it to a big group of people who you don't know are going to be exposed, right? Because it's going to hurt some of them maybe needlessly. Uh, may, may debilitate some of your soldiers. On the other hand, far better a few get debilitated in boot camp than 90% of them die on the battlefield, right? So 
again, and some of these things are quite rapid acting, and it's, it's hard to counteract them once they've been exposed. So if, if you believe that your soldiers are going to go into an area where they're going to be exposed to some of these toxins, yeah, you want to treat them before they ever get these toxins, because uh, prevention is better than, than, you know. Yeah. Well, when we come back from this break, Ethan, we're going to talk about how you test a, a, a remedy, an antidote or a vaccine, how you test that. It's pretty dangerous business, and if, and if you want to try to find something that'll stop it, uh, you may have a problem on your hands. Oh, yeah. We'll be right back. Oh, there's so much more. We'll be right back after this break. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, and they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff, but I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour, we're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Well, I guess you've been thinking over the past minute or so about exactly how they test antidotes and vaccines with such lethal, uh, lethal uh, you know, uh, uh, organisms and toxins. Um, so I guess, you know, the, the question is, uh, who, who volunteers for that? <laughs> <laughs> and how can, you, how can you actually bring a volunteer force in um, without getting somebody dead? Yeah, it's, it's, that's certainly, it's one reason that it's probably not a lot of that formal testing has been done in a, in a rigorous clinical setting, because essentially it's completely unethical to expose people to a, a risk like that with no benefit to it. Uh, in, if you're the kind of person who's going to think about using these toxins in a warfare situation, the odds are you're not too worried about the niceties of clinical trials and medical ethics and all, so you're probably... If you're unethical in the first place. Right, you're probably going to... You don't care much about research ethics. Find a group of people who you don't particularly care for anyhow and shoot it over them and see what happens to them as, a, as your test case, you know? Yeah, but we care. Um, the U.S. Right. cares. We're still, I mean, the last time I looked anyway, right. uh, we're still ethical about this. Yeah, so, I mean, the thing you try to do is find something as closely related as possible. You would figure, you know, macaque monkeys might be... A, one of the better bets of very closely related species to us. Likely anything that hurts them is probably going to hurt us and vice versa. But not humans. Yeah. Um, so there can, there can really be no clinical trials with humans. On some of these things, I don't, I don't think you could yeah. ever get anything past the medical review committee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I suppose you could, take, you could take your antidote or your vaccine Same. and you could try that on a human and see without, without having the toxin right. introduced into his body right. and you can see whether that hurts him. Yeah, and you can try again micro doses of the toxin and, again, and, and see, what kind of and see do people who have been vaccinated against it do better and not suffer any ill effects. Yeah. But some of these things, yeah, your, your, your line between a safe dose and a deadly dose is very, very thin. Uh, I mean, are there, are there other uh, you know, ways to deal with it? For example, sometime after 9-11, people forget now, but there was anthrax. Right. Yeah. And it was being deployed by, uh, by envelopes yeah. to, to VIPs and anybody. Yeah. And they would open the envelope, and it'd be this white powder inside. Right. And uh, uh, there were a number of people who who had envelopes with anthrax powder right. inside, right. which is a bacteria that causes a very serious toxin. Right, a, a could be fatal toxin. Right, right. Yeah, yeah the so anthrax spores. How does that work? Say again. Anthrax spores, right? Uh, yeah, because they're very, very light. And so as soon as you open the envelope, you've put these things already into the air, and you're probably going to start inhaling some. And the inhalation route is pretty deadly with anthrax. Something like 90% of the people who get a decent dose inhaled will die unless they're treated pretty promptly. That was really a clever, if not. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't work really well. I mean, there were something like 
uh, maybe a couple hundred people, 75 people who were impacted, but no deaths, as I recall, no even really serious illnesses. Uh, did we ever find out who did that? I, I never heard that they it ever tracked. just went away somewhere. Yeah, it, there was a spate of them, and whether investigations were getting too close to the source and the source stopped doing it because they knew they were being watched or yeah. what, who knows, or. I mean, is, it, is, is, is it something that the average citizen can learn about this? I mean, about opening the mail, for example. I don't know if that's a, the best way to deploy anthrax powder, but um, what, what do we learn from anything? Well, I mean, right, would this person have been better off instead setting them up uh, in uh, air conditioning systems or mylar balloons over festivals and having them pop loose, you know, and, yeah. and just, just shower stuff down on, on bigger crowds yeah. uh, if, if they really wanted to cause some chaos and, and, and disruption. They were trying to target individuals, obviously, and, and that's. Yeah, again, it's a difference between sort of that broad use, weaponizing for broad military use or versus targeting the people who you want to assassinate. And the two require some, some sort of different strategies. Well, you know, we live in a time when things that were considered horrendous before seem to be less horrendous now. Mm -hmm. Maybe life is cheaper now. I don't know what it is. Yeah. But don't you think that this could happen? Oh. I mean, in the past, we've had... You know, lots of talk about uh, germ warfare, but mm -hmm. originally called germ warfare, right. biological warfare, now this kind of uh, biotoxin mm -hmm. warfare. Um, and not only that, but, you know, attempts at uh, d dis 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 disturbing, discombobulating a city or a civilization. Sure. Uh, you can do ag agricultural bioterrorism where you, you knock out the food supply. That's yeah. that's actually been tried and practiced in some in some cases. You mean as, as a as, as a, a technique to, to yeah, it, yeah. Get, get your enemy so you out of your way. So you prepare for it. Yeah, all right. You learn how to do it. Right. You, have a, you have a manual on how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, actually, I think that information technology type of terrorism is the best of all. But hey, this other way <laughs> would would be very disruptive as well. Yeah. Yeah. So what are we doing about this? Do you know? I mean, it can just, you know, you went, you went and researched this. You came up in a matter of minutes with a whole lot of material that I don't think the public knows about. Uh, no, there, there are whole groups of biological weapons experts, people who study biological substances and the toxins and, and the delivery modes and try to keep on top of that, try to they're in touch with the latest so-called dual-use research, research that may have very good applications to help us, but could be diverted into very bad areas. They, they try, I'm sure, our security agencies try to track the materials that are used in that research very closely to see that everything's going to people who are doing legitimate research and not sort of disappearing into dark alleys yeah. where you don't know who's yeah. going to be using Hope it. so. Yeah. And, and I'm sure they're coming up with very clever ways to deal with it. But our options for doing that kind of stuff are rapidly expanding uh, with the new the sort of biological technologies that are available now. This CRISPR, where you can pull let's talk about CRISPR. Yeah, pull CRISPR. genes out, set genes in, so you, you can begin to, to fine tune some toxins, maybe make them more lethal to some people and less lethal to other people. Uh, similarly, make an antidote that, that might be more effective. Uh, than so with CRISPR, you're not going to actually change the toxin itself. Well, you might. Oh, that too. You, well, you could change the genes of the organism that's producing the toxin. That's what I mean. So you, you change the bacteria. Right. You that's change right. the the host. Right. You change uh, you know the the virus. Right. And now the resulting toxin can be stronger. Right. It could be uh, the, or targeted. Right. Or the host organism is now tougher and survives longer or replicates it faster. More. Right. Or dumps out more of it. Yeah. I mean, there's sort of different ways you can go here, and there's so many. These are expanding so rapidly that, that I, I do feel that we're living in, in times when we are, we are likely, at some point, to see some more biological attacks. I, I don't think we've seen the last of them at all. Oh, no. I mean, the Japanese cult, uh, a few years ago, did the Japanese subway sarin attack and botched that terribly and didn't even hurt a single person. Uh, but, but it shows you a, a yeah. view of the future. Yeah. I, again, I, I can't believe more people aren't going to be trying that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's so much sort of cheaper and simpler than doing something with an atomic weapon, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Well, but you can do it in your garage, so. Right, exactly. You can't do an atomic weapon in your garage. Uh, yeah. So, you know, okay, so so we have we have CRISPR, and maybe that's something you can do in a garage, too, mm -hmm. I don't know. Pretty much. Um, and we make it more powerful, we make <laughs> right. it more focused, uh, we make it easier to, to store, to deploy, mm -hmm. uh, we make every molecule of the toxin stronger. Um, and uh, we make more of it, right? Yeah? And uh, maybe we, you know, generally make it easier to deliver. So, 
you know, question though is uh, how, how far can you go with this? Um, for example, can I say that I want this toxin only to make American people sick? Probably not that far. <laughs> but I mean, so I was just reading something recently that they've developed a new way to encapsulate medicines now in this, this uh, peculiar new form of crystallization coating that, that's very resistant to degradation in the body. So you inject these things and 96 hours later, the stuff is still circulating through your body, through your blood, just gradually one at a time, these little capsules are popping open, releasing this medicine in a nice time controlled fashion. So you might be able to do that with a, a toxin that usually would disintegrate and degrade within a matter of a few minutes or a few hours in a battlefield. Instead, you make it long lasting. Now anyone who steps in that battlefield and gets it on their skin, a day later, a week later, may get this thing. So yeah, I mean, there's the, the sort of some really ugly potentials now for these yeah, to, to change yeah. in, in. It strikes me also that you could have that same kind of epoxy process happening where you could introduce one kind of, one element of the toxin, right. Right. and it's just, it's not doing anything, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't make you sick, and then when you're ready, so you're setting up the victim, right. yeah? then you introduce the other one right. in some mm -hmm. other easier you way. Fly over with your drone and miss the area with, with right. component two that drifts down, and suddenly all your surfaces become toxin-laden. Yeah. Yeah. And the only, the only person who is affected by this is the one who has received dose number one on the first element. So your troops have yeah. not received dose number one. Yeah, but it's, they're not affected by dose number two. Yeah, but boy, that's, that's dangerous business. That, that's a tri tricky game to play. I mean, you saw in that British case there was a, a couple on sort of on the side who both got poisoned too, and nobody quite knows how they apparently touched something that the that had the, the compounds on it. Yeah. And, so it, it's, yeah, that, that is, that's the classic dilemma with, with how do you make the stuff hurt your enemies and not hurt yourself. It's, it's a so very- So where is this going, Ethan? It, it, it strikes me that when, you know, when you added uh, CRISPR to the, to the recipe here, uh, CRISPR, we don't even know the possibilities of CRISPR at the, at the microbiological level. Um, we could create, somebody in the garage could create some toxins that would be unimaginable um, and would be easier to handle and would uh, and you, uh, a, a state actor wouldn't be so concerned about it blowing back on him right. um, because he could control it because of these biological changes that CRISPR could make in it. Where are we going on this, Ethan? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I would like to think that the state actors are all of sufficient moral character, let us say, that they won't mess with this. We, we do have a, a treaty with 181 nations that have signed swearing they That's won't. That's right, they, there's they a treaty against they, this. They, they, they won't develop, they won't deploy, they won't store this stuff, it's they won't, won't, won't yeah. ever use it. But there's no enforcement right. to that treaty. Right, unfortunately, there is no, no inspection, no enforcement of any sort. But the non-state actors, to me, are the bigger danger now, the, the, the fanatical cell group of people who yeah, really don't care too much and if you've got an antidote for it, even if you've only got a few dozen doses, that's enough to take care of you and, and your dear cell members, right? And it runs all the way and from sort of, assassination. Yeah, you to sort of don't care who else gets it. Assassinating a population, yeah, yeah. a subset population, yeah. can be reached by a CRISPR-treated um, yeah. uh, toxin. Yeah. Well, I, I I really enjoyed this unlikable <laughs> science with you. It's, it's, it's been, been thoroughly distasteful. Okay. It's been the least likable science I think we've yeah, had. Really, and if you don't mind, don't don't touch me. <laughs> Bye, Ethan. Take care, Jay. <laughs>